All right, here we go. Today is Sunday, July 17th, 2022, and this is episode 268 of the Defensive Security Podcast. My name is Jerry Bell, and joining me tonight, as always, is Mr. Andrew Kellett. Hello, Jerry. How are you, sir? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I, uh, I see nobody else can see it, but I see this amazing background that you've done with your studio and all sorts of cool pictures. Did you take those? I did not take those. They are straight off Amazon. They're actually, it's, I'll, I'll have to post a picture at some point, but the, the, the pictures are actually sound absorbing panels. Wow. So I, there's jokes. I'm not going to make them, but anyway, I'm doing great. Good to see you. <laughs> awesome. It's a reminder that the thoughts and opinions we express on the show are ours and do not represent those of our employers. But as you are apt to point out, they could be for the right price. It's true. It's true. That by the way, what that really means is you're not going to change our opinions. You're just going to hire them. Correct. That's right. Sponsor uh, our existing opinions. Someday that'll work. All right. So we have some interesting stories today. The first one comes from scmagazine.com. The title is Why SolarWinds Just Might Be One of the Most Secure Software Companies in the Tech Universe. It's a pretty interesting one. I, I, I went into this a little mm, cynical, but there's a lot of really interesting stuff in here. Yeah, there, there is. I think what I found interesting, a couple of things. One is it's very obvious that this is a planted attempt to get back into the good graces of the IT world. But at the same time, it is very clear that they have made some pretty significant improvements in their security posture. And I think for that, it deserves a, a discussion. Yeah. Not only improvements, but they're also having the strong appearance of transparency and sharing the lessons learned, which we appreciate. Correct. The one thing that I, so, so we'll get into it a little bit, but they still don't really tell you how the the thing happened aliens yeah obviously it was aliens they did tell you what happened and so in the article here they describe this the CISO of solar winds describes that the attack didn't actually change their code base so the attack wasn't against their code repository it was actually against one of their build systems and so they were, the, the adversary here was injecting code at build time, basically. So it wasn't something that they could detect through code reviews. It was actually being added as part of the build process. And by inference, they had pretty good control. At least they assert they had good control over their, their source code, but they did not have good control over their build process. And in the article, they go through the security uplifts they've made to their build process, which are quite interesting. Like they, I, I would describe it as they have three parallel build channels that are run by three different teams. And at the end of, at the end of each of those, there's a comparison. And if they don't, if they don't match, if the, they call it a, a deterministic build. So there are like the security team does one, a DevOps team does another and a QA team does a third and they're all building the same set of code. They should end up with the same final, final product. All of the systems are, are central to themselves. They don't commingle. They don't have access to each other's. So there should be a very low opportunity for, for an adversary to have access to all three environments and do the same thing they did without being able to detect at the end when they do the comparison between the three builds. So I thought it was a novel approach. I hadn't thought about it. It, it seems, it, I, my first blush was it seemed excessive, but as the more I think about it, it's probably not a huge amount of, of resources to do. So may, maybe it makes sense. 
Yeah. It also, they mentioned that three different people are in charge of it. Right. And so to corrupt it or somehow inject it into all three would take somehow corrupting three different individuals somehow, some way. Yeah. They would have to collude. The, the three teams would have to collude. Yeah. With each other. Which is difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. So they actually, I haven't looked into it, but they actually say that they've open sourced their, their approach to this, the multi kind of multi, what I'll just call multi-channel build, which I thought was interesting. So anyhow, yeah. there's a, it's a good read that they talk about how they changed from their prior model of having one centralized sock under the, the company CISO to three different socks that monitor different, different aspects of the environment. They went from having a kind of a part-time red team to a dedicated red team who's focused on the build environment. I, I will say the one reservation I have is this kind of feels maybe a little bit like they're fighting the, the last war. And so all the stuff that they're describing is very focused on addressing the thing that failed last time. And are they making equal improvements in, in other areas? Could be. I would say that they're stuck in a bit of a, a pickle here where they need to address the common question is how do you stop this from happening again? That is, that is what most people are going to ask them. It's what the government's asking them. That's what customers are asking them. And so they're, they're somewhat forced, whether that's the most efficient use of resources or not to deal with that problem. Right. Right. They, they have no choice, but I also feel like a lot of the changes they met, built change to their build process would catch a great many other supply chain type attack outcomes. Seems yeah, to me. Fair, fair it, enough. It's also interesting because a lot of these things are easy to somewhat explain. I bet there's a lot of devils in the details that they had to figure out. And they mentioned that they did, they halted all new development of any new features for seven months and turned all attention to security. Yeah. And so it sounded like they moved from, I think, an on-prem dev and build environment to one that was up in AWS so that they could dynamically create and destroy them as needed. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting, the fundamental concept that this article is saying is, Hey, once you've been breached and you secure yourself, do you have a lower likelihood of being breached in the future? Are you like, now you have the board's attention. Now you have the budget. Now you have the people. Now you have the mandate to secure the company. And but is that true? I, I, I think it is situational. We know that there are some, I'm drawing a blank. I think it's one of the hotel change. I, I don't want to say the wrong name, but I, I, I believe that there are, there are also instances you know, rel readily available where the contra is true. Like they just keep getting hacked over and over. And I sometimes wonder if that has to do with the complexity of their environment and the legacy stuff in their environment. If you look at a company like, I don't know anything about SolarWinds, but I'm guessing, you know, that there's somewhat of a fairly modern IT footprint that may be somewhat easy to retrofit as opposed to a hotel chain, with probably some huge data centers that are incredibly archaic in their potential architecture and design and that's, you know, that's a good point. It's a very good point. It's a different, it's a very different business model, right? And they talked about how they're spending, they've got three different tiers of socks now outsourcing two of them. They're spending a crap ton of money on security. Yes. Whether with CrowdStrike watching all their endpoint stuff, they mentioned it here. I'm sure that CrowdStrike appreciated that. Their own tier three sock, they got a lot of stuff. And they're also talking that now their retention rates for customers are back up in the nineties, which is pretty, pretty good. So I don't know. Yeah, clearly this is a PR thing, but at the same time, I really do appreciate a company that's gone through this sharing as much as they're sharing because the rest of us can learn from it. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that's interesting, because I look at this, because I work for a software company now and it's a small company. It's nothing the size of these guys and we don't have the resources these guys have, but I think about how many points in our dev chain probably could be easily corrupted in a supply chain attack that they're stopping with their model that I wonder what, what could I do? Like how much of this could you do mm -hmm. on a budget? There's a huge amount of people environment here. There's a huge amount of, of red tape and bureaucracy and checks and balances that 
must add tremendously to the cost, probably slow things down a little bit, probably got would get pushback if you just tried to show up at your dev shop and say, hey, we're doing this now without having gone through this sort of event. So what I'm dancing around here is the concept of culture. Of post-breach, you now have a culture that is probably more willing to accept what could be perceived as draconian security mandate over how they do things as opposed to pre-breach. Yeah, but it, it, it probably doesn't scale down very well. Yeah. And with the, the overhead that they've poured on any, they also in the article point out that, you know, it remains to be seen how well solar winds continues carrying on, but it does, you know, like you said, it does seem like they've, they've definitely taken this and learned from it and not only learned from it, but also have like we see in this article are trying to help the rest of uh, the rest of the industry learn, which is by the way, like what we're trying to do here on the show, kudos to them for that. Yeah. I also wonder how many other dev development shops will learn from this and adopt some of these practices. So they're not the next supply chain attack. Cause that's really where the benefit comes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. On to the next story, which comes from computerweekly.com. And the title here is log for shell on its way to becoming endemic. So the, uh, the U S government after Joe Biden's president, Joe Biden's cyber executive order in, I think it was 2021, maybe formed this cyber security, what is it called? The cyber cyber safety review, board. cyber safety review board. I couldn't remember the S. Yeah. which I think was modeled after the NTSB or, or what have you, but they, they released this report last week, which describes what happened in, or at least their analysis of what happened in the Log4j incident that happened last year. And so I have mixed, mixed emotions about this one, you know, that one of the, one of the key findings is that open source development doesn't have the same level of maturity and resources that, that commercial software does. And on the one hand, the, you know, one of the promises of open source was many eyes makes bugs very shallow, which I think we've seen is not really holding water very well. But it, but I think the other problem is it's asserting that open source developers are uniquely making security mistakes in their development. In the last I checked, every single month for the past 20 plus years, Microsoft releases a set of patches for security bugs in their software, and they are not open source. And, and so I, I, I think, and it, what's a little frustrating to me is they didn't, it, didn't, it feels like they didn't address the, the elephant in the room which was not necessarily that the, the, that the open source developers here did a bad job. They didn't understand how to code securely. It's self-evident that they made a, they made some mistakes, but the bigger problem is the fact that it was rolled up into so freaking many other open source and non-open source packages in, and multi-tiered, right? combined into a package that's combined into another package that's combined into another package that's combined into commercial software. And the big challenge we had as an industry was figuring out where they, where all that stuff was. And then at, even after that, trying to beat on your vendors to come to terms with the fact that they actually have log4j in their environment and then having to make these like painful decisions. Do we stop using, for instance, VMware, because we know that they have VM, that they have log4j and they haven't released a patch at the time they have since, by the way, but that, that is, I think that's the more concerning problem, not just obviously for log4j, but when you look across the industry, we have lots of things like log4j that are pretty managed by either a, a single person or a very small team on a best effort basis. And they serve some kind of important function and they just keep getting 
consolidated. And I don't think there's a real appreciation for how pervasively some of these things are being used. They do talk about in the recommendations about creating built, you know, better bill of material for software, which I think is good, but it still, that's like coming at it the wrong way. It seems to me like we need to be looking for hotspots and addressing those hotspots. And I, I just don't, I'm not seeing that. And it's concerning to what, me. What do you mean by hotspots? Hotspots in terms of potentially poorly managed or not, not that's not the right way to say it, but less well-managed open source packages that have become super ingrained in the IT ecosystem, like Log4j, like OpenSSL has been, and some of the other bash and, and, and so on. We see this come and go, but at the end of the day, I, I, I don't know that we have a good handle on where those things are. So we're just going to continue to get surprised when some enterprising researcher lifts up a rug that nobody's looked under before and realizes, oh gosh, there's this piece of code that was managed by a teenager in the proverbial basement and they've since moved on to college and it's, you know, it's not being maintained anymore, anymore but it's like being used by, by everybody and their dog. We don't seem to be a thinking about that problem, at least in yeah. that way. Yeah. You said something early on in the covering this too, about how open source is less rigorous in their controls than commercial. But I think it's very fair to say that the vast majority of commercial applications are reusing tons of open source absolutely in their code, right? That the kind of odd implication there is that commercial entities write everything to the ground up when that's not true. Now here's the flip side. If I've got a well known, mature vetted package that does its job well, that I can include in my software package, I could potentially save myself a lot of bugs and, and vulnerabilities because that package has been so well vetted in theory, right? hundred you know, percent. Yep. It's like writing your own encryption algorithm, bad idea. There's a whole whole litany of people who've ended in ruin because they thought they knew better. And that's a really hard problem to solve. So I think there's value in having almost like engineering standards of this type of strength of concrete that is reused because it's a known quantity as opposed to, Hey, we're just going to invent some new concrete, and give it a whirl. I see it a little bit like that, but I, I agree with you. I, I also wonder how often dev shops can spare someone who whole job is to dig deep into the ecosystem of all the packages they pull in when they do their development and know the life cycle of those to the level we're talking about versus, Hey, that's a solved problem. I'd just pull it off the shelf and move on. I think that is the very issue as I see it. That is the problem because I don't think most companies have the ability to do that. What are you thinking? Like a, a curated market of I open think, source tools that are well-maintained. I think we're headed in that direction. I don't, I don't love the idea by any stretch. I'm not saying, don't mean to imply that I do, but I, I don't see a good alternative. And the reason is that, like you said, you want as a, as the developer of a application, whether it's open source or not, you want to use. You don't want to recreate something that's already existing and you want to use something that's reliable. I think that one of the problems is that these smaller pieces of open source technology, like I have a strong feeling that like when the, when log4j started out, they didn't expect that they were going to be in every freaking piece of commercial and open source software out there. It just happened. It happened right. over time and. You know, I, and, and I, I just think there was little consideration on both sides of the equation for what was happening. It was just happening and yeah. nobody really was aware of it. It's not like the log for Jay team was like, come use me everywhere. And then there's a little bit of, Hey, I wrote this. It's up to you. If you want to use it, that's on you. Yeah. It's there. Caveat emptor. So it's, yeah, this is, I don't know. It's a tough problem. I don't know the software build materials is your solve either. I know a lot of people are talking about it. I know that it helps, but it, I think it, it helps in so much as if you have a, a few as a you know, manufacturer of software, or even you as a, you know, a consumer have a S bomb that goes all the way down, which by the way, is itself a pretty tricky, 
when something like log4j hits, you, it becomes much easier to look across your environment and say, yep, I got it there and there. Yeah. That's what I have to go fix. By the way, like it's, you're also dependent on your closed source commercial software providers also doing a, a, a similar kind of job. So I think there's a, a coming set of standards and processes that the industry is going to have to, you know, to get to, because this problem isn't going to go away. It's going to continue to get worse. And uh, somebody's either going to, some enterprising government like Australia or India or the U S is going to stuff a solution. None of us would like down our throat, or we're going to have <laughs> to come up with something. Yeah. You're not wrong. It'll be interesting to see how, how it plays out. Uh, now that I think this genie is out of the bottle, you got to assume some of these big cybercrime syndicates or whatever term you want to use are attempting to replicate this. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. They got to be looking around saying, what is, what, what open source components exist in pervasively and, and what would be easy ish for me to take over slash compromise so that yeah. I could roll in, roll up into as, as many environments as I can, like that yep. would be super convenient as a, as an adversary. So anyway, the, the lots more to come on that. I, I do think we're going to see lots of hyper focus on, on uh, source code, supply chain, open source coming. And I fear that it's going to be largely misguided for at least for a while. Fair enough. All right. The next story comes from Bleeping Computer, and this is a fascinating one. Title is Hackers Impersonate Cybersecurity Firms in Callback Phishing Attacks. Clever people. We, we have a story here about an adversary or maybe multiple adversaries who have become super enterprising, and they are sending letters to unwitting employees at different companies. And I don't know how well targeted this is. There's, there's really not a lot of discussion about that. But in, in the example they cite, they have a letter. I, I think it comes by way of email on CrowdStrike letterhead. And it basically says, hey, CrowdStrike and your employer have this, have this contract in place. We've seen some anomalous activity. You have, you and your company are beholden to different regulatory requirements and we have to move really fast. We need you to call this phone number and to, to schedule an assessment. And it, unlike, by the way, a lot of, a lot of these things is pretty well written. I would like to think that if I got it, I would say that's a BS, but like it is really well written. There's not, it's not full of grammatical errors that kind of makes sense. And, and apparently if you follow the instructions, by the way, it, you know, the hypothesis is that it'll lead to unsurprisingly a ransomware, uh, infection. Because they'll install a remote access Trojan on your workstation and then use, use that as a beachhead to get into your, your company's network. Yeah. I hate to say it, but another good reason why you shouldn't let your employees just randomly install software. <laughs> yes. And you have to assume there'll be some, this is where I struggle by the way, with social engineering training is I really do believe, and it's not a failure, it's not a moral failure, it's not an intelligent failure. It's, it's a psychological weakness of how human beings brains work that these bad guys are exploiting and they will find some percentage in some certain circumstances that will fall for these sorts of efforts. And you've got to be resilient against that. I don't think you can train that risk away. I, yeah, I would say that it's perilous to think that you can train it away. Because then you start to think that when it happens, it's the failure of the person. And I actually think that's the wrong way to think about it. If you have, obviously you want to do some, a level of training. Sure. Just if for no other reason, you're obligated to do that by many regulations and whatnot. But also like you want people to understand like what to look for. It's, it helps in the long run, but at the end of the day, like you, we have to design our environments to withstand that kind of issue, right? If, yeah. if, if we're, if our security is predicated on someone recognizing that a well-written email on CrowdStrike letterhead is, is fake, like we have problems. Yeah. If, if you're never going to be taken down by one Aaron click on an employee, 
that I think is a problem you need to solve. Yeah. And that's a failure on, on, on our, like IT and yeah. security side, not on the employee side. Yeah. So Agreed. anyway, be on the lookout. Obviously this is a pretty, I hadn't heard of this before. It makes total sense in hindsight, but something to be on the lookout for. All right. The last story we have comes from cybersecurity dive.com. It's one of my new, new favorite websites, by the way, They're, they have good stuff on there. Title is Microsoft rollback on macro blocking in office. sows confusion. So earlier in the year, Microsoft made a, a much heralded announcement that they were going to be blocking macros in Microsoft office from anything that was originated from the internet. And, uh, and that was borne out by the way, by an apparent, but some researchers have said that it's much as two thirds of the attacks involving macros has fallen away. So pretty effective control. Microsoft last week announced that they were reversing course and re-enabling macros. I assume because CFOs everywhere were in full meltdown that their fancy spreadsheets were no longer working. And obviously we should assume that the attacks are going to be back on the upswing. And uh, apparently this is a temporary reprieve. It's a little unclear when Microsoft is going to re-enable it, but I have a strong feeling that a lot of organizations have taken us, taken a, a, a breather on this front because Microsoft solved it for us. And now we, we need to be back on, on the, the defensive. Yeah. I'm really curious what the conversation was like that forced them to reverse course. Like what broke that was that big of a deal that was so imperative because this has been a problem for at least 15 years with oh, Microsoft. Yeah. Oh yeah. At least this was a, a pretty big win and now it's kind of getting rolled back. So. I was disappointed. So there are in, in the, I think there's some links in here. You can actually go back and re-enable it through group policy settings. Obviously if, if you're so inclined, it's probably a really good idea as a, as an IT industry, I think we're worse off for this change until they re-enable it. Yeah. This is without knowing all the reasons behind it, this feels like such a pure example of productivity versus security sort of trade off and playing out in real time. Yeah, I can almost guarantee that's what's going on. So that, yeah, that is a little concerning. Definitely be on the lookout. Indeed. We'll see what happens. To be continued. Stay to, tuned. To be continued. And that is, that is the story for tonight. Just one little bit of editorial. You know, I, I spend a lot of time during the week reading different stories, all kinds of Google alerts set up for, for different security stories and, and whatnot to, to help pick what we talk about on these podcasts. And it is amazing to me how many stories that are couched as news are actually basically marketing pieces. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, I know that we've talked about this in the past, but it is alarming. I actually gotten to the point now where I drop down to the end to see what they're going to try to sell me before I get too invested in this. I look at who wrote it and if they're like not a staff writer, if they're like contributing writer from chief marketing officer from blah, blah, blah. I'm like, nope. Yeah. I, I very quickly just stop reading it if it's something written by an employee of a vendor of some variety. And I, I don't mean to be that harsh about it. It's just. There's a bias there that they believe their own marketing and their own dog food, and they're clearly pushing the problem they know how to solve. Yeah. They're characterizing the problem as something that their offerings can solve. Right. And, and I think it's a, it's a certainly an understandable position, but I, I'm concerned that as a industry, where do we go to get actual best practices? Because if you if everything you read is written by a security vendor who wants, you know, your, the best practices are install CrowdStrike, install Red Canary, install McAfee, install. You bring up an interesting, you bring up an interesting side point, which is I'm seeing some movement in the cyber insurance industry that they're basically saying, 
at the broadest level, for those that are less sophisticated, these are the three EDRs we want you to have one of. And if it's not one of these three, you don't get premium pricing. Oh, that's interesting. And you're like, wow, especially because it's such a blanket statement and so many environments are different. And I'm, I'm not passing judgment on the efficacy of those three vendors, which is why I'm not saying them. It's more, that feels like a very lack of nuanced opinion, that very blunt instrument being applied there. Yeah. And it also ignores like a whole spectrum of other stuff that you should right. be doing. And in... that's just their EDR table stakes, right? Ah, and which is all okay. coming very much from ransomware. They're just getting their ass kicked with ransomware payouts. And so they're like, what is, what will stop ransomware? Fair enough. That's a yeah. fair, that's a but fair point. Back to your point about so many marketing pieces being masquerading as InfoSec news, I think is very true. And on that note, I want to thank today's sponsor of Bob's Budget Firewalls. <laughs> We proudly have, I think we've, we've cleared 10 years of no, no vendor sponsorship, <laughs> no sponsorship of any kind other than uh, donation. Yes. Which we appreciate. All right. That is the show for this week. Happy to have uh, done two weeks in a row now. Got to make a habit of this. I know. This is great. I appreciate it. All right. For all four listeners, we still have. I, I, I'm moved to a commercial podcasting hosting platform. And so we get actually now get some metrics and we have about, about 10,000 ish. Wow. Or so so. Is that counting the inmates that are forced to listen as part of their correction? No, like see, see, I, th I think actually, because that's a one to many thing. So there's probably true. like one stream is forcing like maybe 500 people to listen. Yeah. And then when they do crowd control, like that could be thousands of people. That is true. I was quite entertained and really proud of you when I found out that your voice was found to be one of the best tools to disperse crowds. <laughs> hey, we all have to be good at something, right? It is up there with fire hoses. Yeah. It's yeah. right neck and neck. Better than tear gas. I, are you aware of this? Better. I gas. was not aware that I had t overtaken tear gas. It's impressive, my friend. You should be proud. I, I am. Your parents should be proud. I am. I'm going to go tell them. All right. <laughs> All right. Have a good one, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.